All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay, Sim. And hopefully you can see our COVID dashboard. Um, and um, we'll just go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us. So um, we're at 108,193 cases. Uh, and that represents a big jump. It's 420 uh, new cases. So typically our, our cases um, were, you know, coming down nicely and we would only have just a few dozen um, every day uh, or every time we updated. And now it's jumped up quite a bit. So that just represents uh, what should not be a surprise to anyone at this point, which is that, you know, with this surge, we're just having increased transmission and, um, and, and higher case counts every single time. Also added two fatalities. And unfortunately this number is going to continue to rise. It probably hasn't even started rising to the extent that it will. Um, we know that we're still probably a couple more weeks away from the, the death starting to come up. Uh, however, the hospitalizations are definitely coming up. Today we're at 265, possibly as high as 275, depending on which dashboard you're looking at, uh, and up to 48 um, ICU patients. Um, we've been, we've been, we're being asked about, you know, what is the age breakdown? Uh, does this represent kids? Does this represent older folks? Um, we don't have that granular data um, as of now, um, but we're trying to track it. Uh, overall, we do believe that it's trending younger, uh, meaning, um, you know, people between 19 and 50. Um, but we know that the Children's Hospital uh, is admitting increased numbers of cases. Uh, and even downtown at our hospital, at my hospital, CRMC, uh, they have uh, the pediatric service is admitting cases. So we know that young kids are going to be affected, um, and that's that's um, got some implications because we know schools are opening um, uh, this week, next week, and in the weeks to come. And we are um, just you know waiting and, and bracing ourselves for uh, what I think is a very tragic dimension to this surge, uh, which is that young people. Uh, are not going to be spared. That's why we've been working so hard uh, with our school partners to really uh, emphasize safety. Um, and I'll talk more about some of the things that we're doing uh, to help emphasize that, that safety messaging um, with, uh, with young people and around young people. Sorry, I just have to do that. Okay. Um, this is actually our youth dashboard. Are you guys still able to see this? Hopefully you can. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So this, this is a dashboard that our Epi team put together. Um, it, it's actually pretty neat because it focuses on just um, the under 19 age group. And this just gives you more information um, because again, we keep getting inquiries about total number of youth cases. So as you can see, we've had you know almost a fifth of our total caseload is uh, in this population. And it's just going up and up. And we don't even have um, August listed yet, but these lines will just continue to rise um, just throughout August. So you can look on this page. This is also available on our, um, on our website now. Um, and uh, just lots of information broken down by county and community and where kids are getting it. The bottom line is kids are getting it from household contacts. Um, which means that, you know, the best way to protect school children is to get their parents and their families vaccinated. Uh, and, you know, if there is an outbreak in a school, uh, unfortunately, the kids are going to be able to bring that home uh, to their uh, relatively um, vulnerable, uh, you know, family members, if they live with grandma, for example, or if they have an immunocompromised um, relative living in their home. This is really, um, the Delta variant really takes advantage of whole families. Uh, and so households are, are uh, at great risk. And the best thing we can do is really get everyone that's over age 12 vaccinated. Uh, here's our overall vaccine uh, statistics. We're, we're now inching up towards that 1 million dose mark. And that's so fantastic. Uh, it really translates into um, approximately uh, 59.4% of our residents that are 12 years and older vaccinated. And so that's basically um, pretty good, but we still have room to improve. Um, and there's you know several hundred thousand people that we're trying to reach. Um, so um, you know our total population that's eligible is 
858,000. And, um, and so we're still trying to reach those last uh, few hundred thousand uh, as, as much as we can. And really the time to get vaccinated is now is what we're telling people is if you've been waiting, there's never been a better time to get vaccinated. Um, it really will uh, pay huge dividends in keeping you safe and keeping your family and children safe. And um, that's basically what we're trying to tell um, our, um, our, um, with our, our messaging. Okay, this order, uh, are there any questions so far about statistics? Because uh, now I'm gonna dive into orders and announcements. All right, so this is an order that came out really on the afternoon of our last medical call, and I don't know that we had a chance to discuss it, uh, but this was basically an August 5th state officer order. And it's really a little bit stronger, but a little bit simpler than uh, the last health officer order. So uh, here, Dr. Aragon at the state is saying, people just have to get vaccinated by September 30th. And so that's basically the point of this order is if you're in healthcare and you work in one of these healthcare facilities, uh, that all workers who provide services or work in these facilities have to have their first dose of a one dose regimen or their second dose of a two dose regimen, meaning you're not partially vaccinated, you are fully vaccinated by September 30th. Um, so don't wait till the very last day to start. You need to have your second vaccine done by September 30th, which means your first vaccine has to be done two to th uh, three to four weeks before uh, the end of September. So keep that in mind, tell your staff. We know that there's still a few holdouts that are planning to just do the testing every week or twice a week. And guess what? That's not going to be sufficient. Uh, they actually will need to get vaccinated if they wanna to continue to work as a licensed professional um, here in the state. Um, and, and really everything else is, is not that exciting. It's really just um, uh, talking about the, the, the vaccines that are emergency use authorized meaning Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson are the ones that um, should be used. We are getting some questions about um, the exemptions. Um, and you know, there's two types of exemptions. Workers may be exempt from the vaccine requirement um, if they are declining based on religious beliefs or if the worker is excused from receiving any vaccine due to qualifying medical conditions. So they actually have a nice long blurb about qualifying medical conditions it has to be a written statement signed by a physician, nurse practitioner, or a licensed medical professional. Um, and um, I think it even drills down like what the underlying medical conditions that qualify are. Um, and they don't have to, the statement itself doesn't need to disclose what the medical condition is. It's just that, you know, whoever signing it needs to say that this person has a medical condition that exempts them. So that's pretty straight straightforward. Um, the one that seems to be uh, causing some consternation uh, is the one about religious beliefs. And there, uh, you know, basically, depending on which document you read, it has to be a strong and sincerely held religious belief. And um, so different organizations are taking a different approach to how strict they're going to be about that. We haven't seen any state document uh, or any further guidance about how to, how to thread that needle. Um, and as you can see here, there's really no, you know, it would be nice to have like a blur B that talks about the other exemption, which is the religious exemption, but they don't have that here. Um, and so we're really, I'm, I'm looking just, you know, around the state, I'm asking other health officers, like, how are you dealing with religious exemptions? Uh, we will elevate this to the state as well to see if they, they do plan to have a, um, a more consistent policy about this. Um, my, my, my suspicion is that they probably won't put out any statewide mandate because it's such a politically radioactive issue um, that they don't really want to wade into this controversy. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't make rational decisions. Um, and in fact, I will link to this. This is actually a religion blog called Religion News Service. Uh, and they really have some really nuanced and, and well-documented articles about um, you know, how to think through religious exemptions. So if you are um, navigating these uncharted waters, you're not alone uh, and know that there are resources out there. Uh, I'll link to this article and I will link to um, uh, some templates that you can actually use if you need them to help document religious exemptions. Uh, what this article is actually saying is very interesting is that, you know, hospitals or 
or organizations can convene kind of an interfaith multidisciplinary committee that involves um, an infectious disease physician, um, uh, you know, a, 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 an administrative leader, a clinical leader, uh, such as a CMO or a CNO, um, and, uh, and, and even representative faith leaders to help kind of figure out if these religious exemptions um, kind of pass the test of sincerely held belief or not. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's your prerogative to accept or reject uh, the exemption as valid. Um, but we know that obviously that's hard work and it could actually, um, you know, there's a sensitive way to do that. Uh, so we'll try to help you as much as possible. It's a really interesting uh, topic, you know, aside from the stakes involved and the fact that it makes for awkward conversation, it really is a very interesting topic when you read about, you know, which religions actually comment on this and which ones don't. And, uh, and, and really it's just very, it's very cool to read about. So I will uh, send out this blog uh, and other, um, and other uh, resources to help you work through the religious exemption piece. Uh, hopefully it's not a giant loophole that people are gonna be able to drive a semi truck through. Uh, and obviously we do wanna be sensitive to people who do have strongly held sincere religious beliefs, but we don't want this to be an excuse uh, to abuse the system. Uh, so, so I think that's the bottom line. Uh, and if you do suspect that that's what it's being used for, then you are absolutely within your prerogative. And really it's your responsibility to make sure that that's not happening because otherwise you've got a, a threat to the health of your organization, to your patients and to the health of the public. Dr. Vora? Yeah. I have a question about the medical exemption. I know that the Fresno County Department of Public Health sends out numerous alerts for everything from sexually transmitted infections to um, you know, COVID and pregnancy. Has there been any thought to sending out an alert just reinforcing the true medical exemptions to our local providers? I assume many of them are going to be put under undue pressure to provide vague and ambiguous notes of yeah. If they had a paper that said, these are the guidelines I have to follow, it might actually assist them in um, holding out for some of those patients that are pressuring them. That's a great idea. Um... It's something that uh, actually we had a, um, some great conversations with Fresno Madera Medical Society, but it was really around the other exemption that's making all the headlines, which is the masking exemption for uh, school children. And actually the Fresno Madera Medical Society has released um, a very nice, uh, very short policy statement uh, that, that describes, um, you know, how to approach uh, that, that conversation. Uh, and a lot of what you're asking actually applies to both, which is, you know, um, is really resetting expectations, uh, you going back to the original language of the order and the law, um, and then, uh, you know, giving people valid reasons why or why they don't qualify for the exemptions. So that's something that we can certainly work on. Um, that's a great suggestion, Dr. Thomas. Uh, let me take that back to the team and uh, maybe we can put out a brief policy statement about uh, medical exemptions for vaccination, uh, because it's not just about healthcare at this point. It's really like there's so many or companies and organizations and even the city of Fresno that's now uh, really moving in this direction um, uh, to, to either mandate vaccines or strongly require them. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's a really good idea to have everyone kind of talking the same language and being on the same page about how to do these exemptions. So I'll, I'll definitely work on that. Dr. Vora, this is Dr. Lynchide. I, I agree with Dr. Thomas. I'd be willing to help with that too, because um, that's what I'm seeing in the office right now is a message after message for those notes. And I think um, that would be very helpful to say, I just had a conversation today with a patient saying, I, you know, I can't, I can't medically justify this. Um, and, you know, I can't lie on that note either. So I think, um, plainly spelling that out would be um, really good um, to help just support our community docs. Okay, great, I, yeah. And it's John's wife, Larry. It, so it's a good place to start. So it's supposed to be either based on a medical, mental health or a disability uh, 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 that's present. And to, so to start with, you know, do you have a uh, diagnosis in your, electro, uh, in your medical record uh, that, supports, uh, that supports that exemption? So as a healthcare professional would be expected that at least you have, that you that you have a diagnosis uh, that uh, that would, would would support a uh, medical mental health or disability exemption, uh, particularly in the context of a, a situation where potentially 
that same exemption can impact the, the health and safety of others? I mean, off the top of my head, I think it's like allergy, um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and pregnancy, right? Is there anything else that would qualify? You know, it, it includes medical, mental health, and disabilities. So, you know, without, and th that's the way the, the, the CDPH. I'm talking about the, for the vaccine. I'm talking about for the vaccine exemption. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Well, yeah, we can look into it. It seems like it's a pretty short list. So uh, for, for what it's worth, I think it would be a pretty simple policy statement. But then, you know, what's actually very valuable, which what the Fresno Medical Society did was to add a lot of like scripting notes and ad advice about how to counsel, counsel patients. Because, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of anxiety and emotion tied up to these decisions. And, and I think that's kind of what makes it even hard to even start the conversation. Um, and so that's why when Dr. Thomas says that, you know, doctors are under a lot of pressure, I think that that's the pressure is, you know, because you don't want to, you don't want to have these hard conversations without, um, without some, without some good um, coaching about how to do them. Yeah, these are great comments. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Dr. Vora, is pregnancy a relative contraindication? Can they be vaccinated during pregnancy if they want? Yeah, yeah, no, it's not even a contraindication. It's just it allows you to exempt if the if the person's worried, you know, for whatever reason, and they don't want to get the vaccine until after they've had the baby or for whatever reason. Gotcha. But, you know, it's not a contraindication. It's definitely like recommended. Like if you're pregnant or or thinking about being pregnant. CDC even this week came out with like a recommendation to say, you know, please get your vaccine uh, because the cost, I mean, the risk benefit definitely favors um, getting your vaccine. Right. All right, any other co questions or comments? Dr. Vora, Rick Limbo, I have a quick question if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, what's up? Um, in regard to the booster vaccines, ACIP meeting this morning, does that mean, does it infer that a immunocompromised patient that has had two doses of a vaccine is no longer fully vaccinated? Let me, um, they touched on to that. Meeting, okay. So first they never went back to it. Um, yeah, good, good question, Rick. Um, can you guys see my screen again? This is the CDC update from August 11th that just says, you know, the vaccine is safe for pregnant people. It's recommended. It's encouraged, et cetera. So I'll include this on our um, on the notes from today. And then the question that you asked um, was what I was getting to, which is that the FDA has indeed authorized additional vaccine doses for immunocompromised individuals. The FDA kind of dropped this last night and ACIP had their meeting this morning. Uh, and I think everyone's on board that this is the high risk population that needs to have a third dose of the mRNA vaccine. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking whether if they've had only the two doses, uh, then are they considered fully vaccinated? And I think it's kind of a semantic question, but you know, they, yes, they are fully vaccinated, but you know, one of the axioms of immunology is that vaccines don't last forever. Uh, and that immunity can wane. Um, and I think that that's what's being observed, especially in patients that have immunocompromising conditions, uh, either related to solid organ transplants uh, or um, something else that's causing them to have immunocompromised, whether that's an autoimmune disorder, medications that they're on, uh, HIV, et cetera. Uh, and, and it has to be a pretty, you know, I think ASIP came in and qualified it to say it has to be a moderate to severe immunocompromised. Uh, not just mild immunocompromised, the way that we consider, you know, for example, diabetics or even renal patients uh, to be mildly immunocompromised. Ha this has to be a pretty uh, serious threat to their ability to fight infection. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of where they landed on this. Is it perfect? I don't think so. Um, will it be refined? I bet it will. Does it comment on Johnson & Johnson? Incredibly, it doesn't. So we, we still don't have good guidance about what to do 
And we know that Johnson & Johnson is probably not as good of a vaccine product uh, over time as the mRNA vaccines. So I'm sure they're gonna come out with a, something about Johnson & Johnson. Right now, what they're saying is for your Pfizer patients, for your Moderna patients, you know, if it's been more than 28 days, and really if it's been like around, you know, a few months, like six months, then they're really at risk because their antibody levels are falling way down if they're immunocompromised um, and that they just need to have this third dose. So that's kind of how I'm reading this. Um, uh, I'd love to hear other comments or if people did catch the ACIP meeting, um, what your takeaways from that were. But we're putting out a policy statement um, this afternoon that basically aligns with this to say, it basically gives, gives our vaccine providers um, both cover and direction to go ahead and start this. Um, and so some of, you know, some people like the COVID Equity Project and Kenny Bond are already committed to doing this as early as tomorrow for, for the rest of our vaccine clinics. We know that this might require a little bit of lead time. So as soon as you get ready, you should start scheduling your patients to get the third dose. Um, and you should kind of keep them in their lane, meaning that if they got Pfizer the first two doses, give them Pfizer. If they got Moderna the first two doses, give them Moderna. Um, do I think it's a huge deal breaker if people cross? I don't think so. Just understanding the science of how this works. Uh, other countries have actually allowed mixing and matching. So, you know, to me, with this surge going on, I just want people protected. And so, if it comes down to giving them something versus giving them nothing, I would say give them something to, just to get them protected because uh, I really do worry about this patient population um, during this surge. I really think that they're gonna land in the hospital even though they're vaccinated. And in fact, a lot of the breakthrough vaccinations are coming from this, um, this cohort. Any questions or comments? I guess we have some implications there because, you know, we spent the last week and a half developing protocols and pathways to get the testing for the unvaccinated and the, the AFL language is for those that are fully vaccinated, as Rick said, um, so that would disqualify people that are immune compromised if that that drops off as a definition for them. And it's kind of the honor system as, as, a, you know, as opposed to just verifying vaccination, whether or not you're to standard immune compromised um, is subjective. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, ultimately it's up to, it's up to them to decide, you know, how, how, um, how soon they want to get their third dose. I mean, I would think that they, if they do have an immunocompromising condition, that they would be very eager to get a third dose. Hopefully. <laughs> and if they've had two shots already, I guess is your question, you know, do you need to test them weekly knowing that they're immunocompromised? Um, I'm not even sure that you, that you can even ask their medical history to determine that. Right. Yeah, it's kind of the honor system. Those hopefully that are immune compromised are going to seek a third shot because, you know, we do yeah. have employee health, but it's cursory or cursory and it only, you know, kind of applies to vocational exposures and whatnot. It's not their primary care facility. Yeah, no, good point. Okay, well, let me. Um, you know, like I said, we're going to put out our statement, keep the questions coming. Um, I, we haven't even had a state meeting about this, so I, I can elevate a lot of these questions to the state and uh, hopefully get you better guidance about what, what the expectations are. Just looking on the My Turn um, app, um, let me just share that with you because um, just to let you know, um, when you go to this website, People can register for it, but as you can see, they want you to go and make a second appointment, and there's really not a third appointment tab here. So that's going to confuse patients, unfortunately. They're going to look for a third appointment tab, and it's not here. So I'm, I'm just going to tell people to just make a second appointment, and then you know, when you get to the clinic, just tell them, actually, this is not my second appointment. It's my third appointment. I'm just here to get my booster. because. 
you know, I'm hoping that they change this in my turn over the weekend, but right now it's not changed. So just FYI, th this website's lagging the FDA announcement. Does that make sense? All right. Um, let me see what other announcements I have. Oh, um, so at the hospital level, you know, obviously all of our hospitals are working really hard. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're really experiencing some challenging conditions. There's a few things happening um, that will be germane, I think, to all um, healthcare providers, but especially those working uh, at the hospitals. Um, the first is that the EMS policy um, to just assess and refer patients is now in effect so that if they don't have a medical emergency and they can wait to see a primary care doctor or an urgent care clinic um, or be treated on site, then the paramedics are being directed to do that. And that's really to, to really try to help decompress uh, the hospitals as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, I think everyone should be aware of that expectation uh, and tell your patients that, you know, because things are really strained right now that, that we're having to do that. Obviously, we will review that policy periodically um, and frequently uh, and lift it as, as soon as we can. But right now, we've had to go invoke that just given the, the constraints in the system. We did it before during the winter surge as well. Uh, so that's one piece. People are asking whether alternative care sites are being set up, uh, such as the one that we had at the Fresno Convention Center, the one that we had um, in Porterville. And we are not being told that those are being set up or planned. So this time around, you know, I don't think that we can count on those sorts of alternative care sites. We do still have um, some options related to staffing um, and um, a pathway to request staffing help from the state. Uh, I think that's kind of where the state's, they, that's where the state is choosing to invest resources this time around. And I think that that's appropriate. Uh, so if you do have staffing needs, reach out to us and we can elevate your request to the state and, and see if we can, um, you know, help fill uh, gaps in your in your staffing as it comes up. Um, and Dr. Uh, Laura, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Right I, I want to correct you on that um, because okay. the state the state really has stepped away from the staffing. Now, they they told us that they may start looking into it. But at this point in time, um, that's what's different from now and also you know when we were in the winter um, that the the state um, is is basically saying here's here's the registries that we used you could go look for them yourself and make your own contact but they're not going to have a, um, a cadre of people to send out to help assist and that type of thing they they are not doing that this time which is which is really um, really an unfortunate deal for the for the valley because now it's leaving our hospitals to compete uh, for registry nurses and things like that uh, with other areas of the state and you know when someone has a decision to make of coming to the valley when it's 106 or 108 or going to monterey or some place else it's it's very difficult and so our hospitals are really struggling with with the uh with the the staffing issues right now and um and the state is re-looking at it, but there is no answer to it uh, on uh, at this point. Just wanted to make sure you knew that. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I think those are all of the announcements that I had today. Um, we're putting out just another, in addition to the booster policy statement, uh, we're putting out a health advisory for the general public just to kind of get them up to speed in case they didn't get the memo that we are in a surge and that it's related to the Delta variant, that the vaccines are effective and masks are expected um, indoors. Uh, and then just other kind of tips and best practices about how to limit exposure and decrease risk. Uh, and really just to get the whole community up to speed uh, in, in, on the eve of schools uh, about to reopen, which I think uh, will also unfortunately contribute to increased case counts, uh, hopefully not increased trans, uh, hospitalizations, but uh, unfortunately that will probably also uh, be another element of the, of the remainder of August. Dr. Vora, um, 
Lance Granham. Um, I wanted to know, um, my, uh, my contact at the county tells me she, she no longer has access to the Delta variant information. Where are we expected to get that information? Okay. Um, so are you asking like how many Delta cases we have? Well, usually I check those daily so that I can check the ones around my area so that I know what to expect knocking on the door. Um, and not having that information could be detrimental to everyone. So I'm not sure why we're making it more difficult to get. Yeah, um, I, I understand your concern. I think it's already difficult to get, um, honestly, and the Delta results are, are still lagging by a couple of weeks. So we're not really, um, you know, I wouldn't tag, you know, the Delta status of a patient. You know, I would just assume that they're Delta positive if they're COVID positive. Uh, this is now the dominant strain. It really seems to be over 90% of all COVID cases um, that are found. Um, and so, you know, you, you can just bet that it's a Delta case if you see a COVID positive patient. Currently we have 290 Delta cases in the county, uh, but those are the, just the ones that, you know, the, the state checked, they're not checking all of them. They're just doing kind of random sampling um, in many cases. So they're, it's a gross underestimate. So, you know, I, 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 that's why we're not really trying to, um, I think highlight that number because we don't want people to think, oh, well, you know, there's only a few hundred Delta cases. That's not true. There's actually thousands and they're just not getting the testing that they need to confirm their variant status. And even the Delta test is like not CLIA approved to tell the patient. And so if the patient wants to know if they are Delta positive or not, uh, really the state's answer to that is, you know, we're not giving out patient level information. Uh, this is really just an epidemiological tool to let us know how this strain compares to other strains. I know that that's kind of weird because we're not used to thinking it, with that lens. You know, we're used to thinking, I wanna know everything about my patient at the time that I'm evaluating my patient. And obviously the, the question of the day is whether they have Delta or not, but the state is just looking at, at the macro level and they're really asking a different question, which is you know, among all of the cases, how many of them relatively speaking or fractionally speaking have Delta, and that's kind of the, 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 the tools are designed to answer that question and not the first question. So if we're gonna eliminate tracking that data as a, as a tool, are we going to also eliminate the need for us to send out variants every time or? I don't think so because I mean, the other, uh, you know, the other dimension to this pandemic is if we don't get it under control and if we don't get everyone vaccinated, then you know both of those will accelerate the development of a variant that is not going to be susceptible to vaccines, right? And the only way we will know that is if we do variant testing. So I think that's why the variant testing is being done is to track variants and see, you know, again, at the macro level, whether the vaccines are effective against them or not, and if we, if we somehow identify a variant, and some people say the Lambda variant might be it, other people say that that variant has not been identified yet. But you know, at some point in the future, if we identify a variant where the vaccines are not working against it, then basically we're talking about going back to square one and just developing new vaccines against this new variant. <clears throat> Again, it's, it's a little beyond my level of expertise or decision making, but I think that's the that's the logic that's driving the variant analysis. Oh, did I uh, share about RSV? Sorry, um, one more. Uh, it is Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why there's so many bad omens today. But this one's another one that's worth knowing about, which is that LA County is seeing an uptick of RSV. And if you were on our media briefing or watched our media briefing, Dr. Dahl from Valley Children's did an excellent job summarizing what this is. It's respiratory syncytial virus. It's something the pediatricians are very aware of. 
Um, but it's really something that can co-infect um, patients to where they have both COVID and RSV. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it does, it does lead to a lot of hospitalizations and ICU hospitalizations at the children's hospitals, especially during the winter. So it was concerning enough to where LA, which is not really a wintry city, last time I checked, is now describing an off-season uptick of um, respiratory syncytial virus. And this graph that they show is really interesting. The red squares are this year. Um, and, and basically uh, what they're showing is that the red squares, even though they, we had a great year for RSV because uh, it really didn't have a peak um, earlier in the year, now we basically are in some ways paying for that because there's now an uptick that's way off season that we should be flat right now compared to years in the past. And now they're seeing upticks here that are very concerning. Uh, and in fact, the Southern states are also showing like Houston uh, and other states um, in the South are also sharing the same story is that this is off season. It's a high number of RSV cases. Some of them also have COVID and this is going to be really challenging going into the cooler fall months if this uh, continues unabated. Um, as you're probably aware, there's no uh, vaccine for RSV, um, as far as I as far as I know of, um, and um, there is a it's like a it's like a monthly antibody that high risk patients can qualify for called Synergist, and um, and and what LA is telling people is that you know the monthly antibody is usually only indicated during RSV season. However, given this off season uptick they want uh, clinicians to provide this antibody to high-risk patients, even in the off season. Um, so this is actually, it's, it's from the LA County, like I said, but it's a really great summary of this issue. And uh, here they talk about the synergist prophylaxis uh, and it's really recommended by AAP. So I'll share a link to this as well, because I think it's probably worth your time, especially if you're treating children. Um, but it, it's, not just, it, it's not just a kid's virus, you know, older adults can get it as well. They just end up getting mild versions of it, but when they get it, they're contagious and they can pass it on to more susceptible patients like young children that have smaller airways and they end up getting bronchiolitis. But also other viruses um, that are uh, being tracked, including um, uh, monkeypox virus and Marburg virus, both of which um, have um, been uh, relate relayed as um, causing infections and uh, causing quarantines. Not here in California, as far as we know. Um, these were uh, individuals that were identified in other countries and other states. Uh, but just goes to show you, you know, there's always something new to learn in infectious diseases. So we're, we'll try to relay information that's relevant to our local community as we come across it. Okay, any other questions or topics? Okay, we'll relay all these documents to you um, later today. <coughs> Please look for the um, statement on boosters. <coughs> Excuse me, um, and um, let us know if we can help with anything else. Thanks, Dr. Fora. Sure, thank you. All right, happy Friday. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.